Oh, this is fantastic. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is a great pleasure for me to be among you this evening to talk on a subject that maybe we would hear uh, in many instances on the media uh, and by news agencies and the news. The Iran nuclear deal. Uh, I had the privilege to be in the negotiations from day one, so I can testify some of the principles that we were attached from the beginning, and then I can give you my assessment about the future and uh, the importance of uh, keeping the credibility of the, of the deal. In fact, uh, the problems that I see and the ambiguities that are raised uh, I think that I think they, they can be explained if we go and see why we started such negotiations and what were the, the main important parameters of the negotiations when we started such negotiations. As you know, we started negotiations uh, uh, with the United States first, in Muscat, face-to-face, uh, that was among the maybe first instances that we started such negotiations directly with the United States. So it was not announced publicly. Uh, but two questions were very fundamental when we wanted to start the negotiations. First, that uh, is the United States ready to accept a level of enrichment by Iran. The second question was the scope of the deal that we want to start. On the first question, as you know, uh, we had already started some dialogue with European three, uh, Britain, France, and Germany, in 2003 to resolve the nuclear issue. And unfortunately, it could not be resolved because the United States was not part of party to the negotiations. And uh, in fact, uh, they put some conditions for the EU3 uh, to, to preserve, which was not possible. And the, the most important of all of them was zero enrichment policy. United States rejected any possibility that Iran could have any level of enrichment. So there was no agreement after two years of negotiations at that time, uh, till 2005. So they resorted to the Security Council uh, sanctions, unilateral sanctions, multilateral sanctions, European sanctions. And we also resorted to increasing our capacity for enrichment. That was done for several years until the environment was a little bit uh, more ready for some new talks. So we started this new round with the United States in 2013. So the first question that I fully remember, that the first question that we put to the Americans, are you ready to accept any level of enrichment or not? Because if you are not ready to accept any level of enrichment, we are not going to continue the, com the negotiations. We will be back to the policies that we have. You can go and add your sanctions. We will go and increase our capacity for enrichment. There is no possibility for any deal. So this was the first question. And they said, after uh, some days of intensive negotiations, that yes, we can accept some level of enrichment, of course, uh, within some limits, and definitions that we would embark on defining them. So that the first question was, was answered that yes, there is a possibility for reaching to an agreement and United States can accept this uh, level of enrichment. And I remember that they said that this is a shift of policy by the United States. The second question was scope of the deal. What you are going to resolve? Are we going to resolve the nuclear issue or bilateral issues, 
the problems that we have together on definition of terrorism, for example, human rights issues, the regional issues or differences in, on uh, quite different issues that we are facing in the region and beyond. So there were two possibilities. And both of us agreed that there would be no possibility at the time to entertain a comprehensive negotiations on everything. Because it, is, it would be impossible to resolve all of these uh, very fundamental things. So we agreed both that the only possibility to negotiate is, a, is, is uh, negotiating on a limited subject of the nuclear issue, because that was a subject which was, uh, in fact, uh, interested by both sides, by the international community, by the Security Council, by the European Union, by China, Russia, and, and others. And you know that the group of so-called five plus one was a grouping that was recognized by the Security Council resolution. So that was the mandate that such group of five plus one had to entertain, to start a, a negotiations with Iran on nuclear issue. So it was not possible from what we agreed to go beyond nuclear issue. So you can imagine that how it was astonishing for us surprising to us that we hear that the new government of the United States, President Trump, is saying that we cannot accept this deal because it was limited to nuclear issue. That was exactly the point that we cleared at the first day of negotiations. It was not possible to go beyond nuclear issue because you can imagine that on one issue which is nuclear, we have not able to resolve all of the surrounding issues attached to the nuclear issue. How we can go and resolve regional issues, in fact, definition on terrorism, definition on human rights, and so many complicated issues. It is impossible. So that, that's something that we are very much astonished. And uh, I hope that you can understand that why we are uh, so in fact, uh, uh, believe that the United States is not sincere in its, uh, in fact, belief that there should be a deal on all things, which is, in, in our view, and in the US view also, uh, which we started negotiations was uh, impossible. So now, the situation is that we have a deal which so many parties and international community and even so many uh, international relations theorists and uh, academia are believing to be the, the most important achievement in international diplomacy, at least uh, recent achievements in international diplomacy. That was a very important achievement that we could, uh, in fact, uh, reach to the point because you know that at the time that we started negotiations, they were quite divergent position. We had United States, we had Russia, we had China. In fact, totally different visions about how they look to the world and how we can resolve the issue. We had the European Union. We have, because in addition to the France, Germany, and Britain, we had the European Union, which was represented by uh, high coordinator, special coordinator. So these parties were really uh, difficult to reach to a solution on, on an issue. On a very hectic time, that Ukrainian issue was, was uh, in fact erupted, so many crises erupted, but uh, through the magic of diplomacy, we could reach an agreement between uh, parties which see the world very differently. So we, we really were confident that, in fact, this, this deal would be a real achievement. And I remember that in several occasions, we asked uh, uh, Secretary Kerry that what would, what would happen if there would be a change in the government of the United States? Could you be able to carry the message, the same message? And he was always telling us that we are fully confident that if we can reach to an agreement, we can keep this message, in fact, uh, 
uh, going on and there would be no disruption, there would be total confidence by the uh, US government system, in fact, on the deal. So apart from uh, uh, that assessment, uh, we really hope, hopeful at the time that we can get an, a deal which all parties which were uh, participating uh, and negotiating sincerely, uh, really day and night, we were really hopeful that in fact we can keep it. I, I tell you that that deal was really something that at the time even could be unimaginable by, by so many experts, so many people around the world. We worked on it two and a half years, day and night, so many nights until the midnight. I can assure you that maybe on each and every word, each and every word of, of a document, more than 160 pages, we devoted hours and hours to reach to a compromise. You can, you can go and compare this text of Iran nuclear deal with, for example, what the President Trump is boasting on the declaration with North Korea. Two pages, two pages uh, document, which you can, you can go and see, very generalities, many ideal things, maybe two, two main paragraphs, but so many marginalized issues. But in our case, it was 160 pages of real technical and legal document. So what happens? Uh, aspiration that we have with the aspiration of the uh, European Union, Britain, France, and Germany, and China and Russia, is that we can keep this deal alive and give time to the United States to rethink and revise its position. I tell you as an expert that I was there negotiating this text, it would be impossible to imagine that we can change one word of this Iran nuclear deal. It would be impossible. Because if you change one word, you should change consequently other words, other sentences, other paragraphs, other pages, which is impossible. So the only thing is that we should be able to keep the credibility of this text and then see if there are other concerns. If we would be able to create a, a kind of a climate of better understanding between the parties that we have agreed on something, we have implemented effectively, we have implemented that sincerely, then there would be a better atmosphere to, to think about other issues. But now, if the other parties would tell us that, okay, let's change the atmosphere, let's go to other issues, absolutely it's impossible. There would be no possibility for us that, af that what we have agreed after two and a half years, day and night, leave it aside and start something else. Can you guarantee that, the, that whatever you would produce after this would be uh, faithfully agreed and implemented by the other sides. So the, the thing is that now we have a total loss of confidence and we should be able to restore to the, to the possibility that in fact we can work together, we can sit together and find solutions, compromises, and if that would be the possibility, we can think of additional issues. But it would be impossible that something that we have agreed so precious, we would leave it aside and say that because the government, with the change of government, there is a total new vision, let's uh, set aside and start anew, which is impossible. So I think that the reality is we are trying very hard with the European countries, with China and Russia to find mechanisms that this deal could be effectively implemented. Of course, we know that there is a cloud over the implementation of the deal minus the United States. There would be pressure against some other countries, particularly European countries 
and uh, economic and trade institutions to enter into uh, working with Iran. There would be some, uh, some probably some risks, uh, but I'm sure that there is a total determination by the European countries and other partners to find practical solutions that this deal would be kept alive. Uh, we are working on practical uh, mechanisms. As you know, there is a, a concentrated discussions on a kind of financial mechanism that how we can really uh, have something uh, to work for the banks, that we have some banks and institutions designated that they can enter working with Iran, and they can, they, they can also get the benefit. But we are trying our best to keep something that is important internationally and multilaterally. Even I tell you, even North Koreans are doubtful about reaching an agreement with the United States when they see that whatever agreed can be, can be changed, in fact, with the change of administration. That is unprecedented. If the countries would believe that with the change of governments, the policies would be drastically changed, there would be no continuity within the policies. So for us to be able to maintain and sustain the negotiations and agreements, we should be able to work together and give this important message that if we agree on something, we would be, in fact, keeping the credibility of implementing that. Otherwise, there would be uh, uh, no confidence at the international level to reach to any kind of solution. So I would stop there and I would be delighted to respond to some of the uh, questions and, and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much for those fascinating open rem opening remarks. I want to follow up on the role that European countries can play in implementing the joint plan. Uh, to what extent is it possible that trade with Europe and the European support for this plan will allow the Iranian economy to grow and therefore the deal to be followed in spite of American sanctions? Or do you view American opposition as an insurmountable impediment to the implementation of the deal? Yes. We have a very important lesson that in fact we are not uh, uh, conditioning the betterment of our economy over the, uh, an agreement reached uh, with the Europeans. Because we have learned this lesson that when you are optimistic about a kind of practical approach by your partners, uh, in fact, you can lose uh, sometimes uh, to come up with your realization and inspiration. So we have had this lesson. Because of this, we have started a policy in our, in our country, which we call it resilient economy. We want to immune our economy from the, the risks and dangers that uh, can, create, can be created from the external forces. We are really trying to see what, what we have in our country, how we can, uh, in fact, use better our capacities to grow uh, our economy rather than to be uh, conditional on the situation outside. But certainly never you can disregard the importance of international trade and uh, international econ ec economics. So we are really uh, trying, our, uh, trying hard not only because the benefits that we can get from international cooperation, but because of the importance of keeping the, uh, of the validity of international agreement and, uh, in fact, uh, international treaties that we really want to strive to make all of our efforts to, uh, in fact, ensure that we have agreed on something and we want really to, to make it implemented. So we are discussing uh, with European countries, uh, in fact, uh, very seriously, and both all sides are really serious to reach uh, to an uh, agreed solutions, practical solutions, that how we can immune our uh, institutions to, to enter into, uh, in fact, working with each other. Sure. You mentioned that America has applied pressure on its European allies to support its stance in the deal. 
To what extent do you view British foreign policy as operating independently of American interest in the negotiation of this deal? It's, uh, let me confess here that we were not really optimistic that they can keep their, their position independent, but they have, they have made so. Uh, they have tried to be independent and, and we see that they are making real efforts to convince the United States that this is not a good policy. I assure you that US is facing with a dilemma. They are permanent members of the Security Council, but now, ironically, they are pressurizing the countries for implementing the Security Council resolution. And that is quite awkward. How a permanent member of the Security Council can punish and sanction other parties because they are complying with Security Council resolutions. But unfortunately, they are doing this. And this is completely and clearly in violation of international law. And this is unprecedented. Because Iran nuclear deal is not only a deal between six parties, seven parties. It's part of a Security Council resolution, 2231. That's part of a Security Council resolution. Security Council resolution has approved and adopted this, this, uh, this deal. So now the United States is telling other countries that if you try to implement the, the JCPOA, as we call it, if you try to enter into working with Iran, we would punish you. That is unimaginable from a permanent member of the Security Council. And uh, that is a very uh, quite dilemma in the United States position. And uh, we, we believe that the countries are, are not following the US position. They are telling the United States that, sorry, this is the United States who is not complying with the Security Council resolution, not the other side. You should respect that we have all the uh, legitimate uh, aspirations to implement this deal and enter into working with Iran. How you can sanction our institutions? French has been, uh, have, have been very clear on this, that how the United States can justify sanctioning and punishing the French institutions try to work with, with Iran. So that's a very awkward position. Sure. At the 27 UN General Assembly, uh, Trump opened with a blistering attack on North Korea, yet then spent the year in negotiations that at 2018, the same year that he criticized Iran, he praised North Korea and Kim's leadership. Given Trump's aggressive rhetoric on Iran this year, do you think that this might be political bluster and that he actually might be willing to engage in a productive discussion with Iran in the same way that he did with Korea after being so critical? Or do you view it as not really an option? Basically, we will really, we, we wish that there would be a solution for the North Korean issue. Because Iran is party to the non-proliferation treaty, we want to see this treaty strong foundation. Uh, so we really hope and wish that the, the bilateral efforts between the United States and North Korea would be successful and North Korea decide to, in fact, renounce the nuclear option and be back to the, to the MPT family. But the reality is that what we see on the ground is not very promising for us, because if you compare the earlier agreements with the last agreement that was, uh, was published, is only a two-page document, you can see that there is, there is no progress. There is even, from the legal and substantive point of view, even there is some regress. That, uh, in fact, uh, uh, there is now less emphasis on some of the key points that were, in fact, agreed uh, previously. So, uh, we, we see that for political purposes, maybe there is, uh, uh, in fact, some overemphasis on the result of the negotiations. But we really hope that there would be a, a great achievement and we really hope 
that non-proliferation regime would be strengthened and North Korea would be among the family and there would be, uh, in fact, less tension in the region. But the, the problem that we see on the negotiations is rather politicizing the negotiations. Maybe one side wants to show that we have, uh, in fact, progressed or we are rapidly progressing, which we, sh we, we should really wait and see. I want to move on to looking at the issue of relations within the Middle East. Uh, over the past year or so, two of Iran's historic adversaries, Israel and Saudi Arabia, have strengthened their relations. Uh, do you view this as a, as a potentially aggressive pact against Iran? And what do you think it means for the prospect of peace in the Middle East? Unf unfortunately, one of the elements which was not positive from the outset is that, uh, uh, in fact, Saudi Arabia was not really helpful for the negotiations. We were receiving uh, quite uh, uh, different messages from the United States that each time they were under pressure from the Saudi Arabia that negotiations should not proceed so smoothly. So it was very clear that Saudi Arabia was not, in fact, a fan of Iran nuclear deal. And that was a real astonishing for us because we were thinking that if the, the concern is really reducing the tension in the region, if the concern is that Iran nuclear issue would be diplomatically resolved through diplomatic efforts, why Saudi Arabia should not be happy, in fact, that there is a deal here? So that was a dilemma for us to, to interpret that what would be the, uh, in fact, the, the reason. But Saudi Arabia, until the last minute of the negotiations, were quite uh, uh, behaving very negatively. Israel also, they were also be behaving very negatively. And they were pressurizing against the Obama administration to enter into any kind of agreement uh, on Iran nuclear deal. That is exactly the dilemma that we see here, that if these, these two <coughs> have real concerns about the uh, Iran nuclear activities, uh, they should be first to encourage any kind of deal, but that was opposite. So that shows us that these, these two look at the situation very politically rather than substantively. For them, the question is not Iran nuclear issue because they are absolutely clear that we do not have any, uh, any uh, malign option, uh, uh, in fact, uh, intention for having the, uh, using the, the uh, nuclear technology. They probably were uh, facing with a dilemma that if Iran would be in fact, the reaching to any kind of agreement, that would be reinforcing the, the position of Iran in the region. Uh, but really, that was always a question, not only for us, but for the US and Europeans and, and Russia and China, that why uh, Saudi Arabia and why, why Israel are not happy and supportive of, the, of Iran nuclear deal. One of the issues in the relationship with Saudi Arabia is the potential of proxy conflicts, such as that in Yemen, such as that in Syria, between uh, allegedly Iranian-backed forces, allegedly Saudi Arabian-backed forces. Uh, to what extent are you optimistic there are chances to de-escalate this sort of regional conflict? Or do you consider that there will continue to be conflicts in other countries as a result of the underlying tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia, between Iran and Israel? We never tried to, to start a proxy war with Saudi Arabia through Syria or Iraq because we were uh, assisting Iraq when Daesh and ISIS was 50 kilometers uh, far from Baghdad. So they came to us, the government of Iraq, Iraq at the time, and said that we are asking for help, nobody helping us, ISIS is 50 kilometers far from Baghdad, and what we can do? So we sent some of our military advisors, and we really tried to help them at the last minute, and uh, always they are telling this story that Iran helped us very lot at the uh, very important uh, juncture. We also uh, assisted 
the Syrian government as the only legitimate government that we see, because Syria is a member of the United Nations, and also from what we, we gathered at the time, Daesh and ISIS had a very ambitious plan. They even included Iran as one of the, one of the caliphates, part of the big caliphates, in fact, a replica of the great caliphates during the early Islam. They even named Iran differently. They were calling Iran Great Khorasan. So in a map that they had produced, Iran was part of their territories. So they had a big plan to start occupying Iraq and Syria and then uh, coming into Iran. That was very clear from their military uh, intentions that they had. So we were conscious of, of this uh, big ambitions that they had. So when the Syrian government asked us for some help, we wanted really to fight Daesh in Syria, to uh, fight against terrorism, because ISIS is among the rare examples that international community agrees that this is a terrorist group. So we sent some advisors to the Syrian government to help Syria to stand against Daesh. And we are there at the invitation of the government of Syria. Unlike the other countries, like the United States, they have not been invited by the Syrian government to help them. There are other parties that they have entered into Syrian territory without the prior authorization from the legitimate government of Syria. So that's a, a long story, but we really have been in Iraq and Syria to help them against terrorism, and we're proud of the achievement, because now you see that Iraq is uh, fully free of occupation by ISIS. Uh, in Syria also, ISIS is, is on the retreat, and they have now occupied only some portion of the territory, but they have lost a great uh, portion of the uh, occupation that they had. So we really tried to be helpful in the region, and Iran has been always an element of stability and security in the region. You can ask our neighbors, you can ask Afghanistan, Pakistan, you can ask Iraq, you can ask other countries in the region. We have, uh, we have a great number of uh, neighbors. We have 15 neighbors around Iran. So, in fact, we have been always trying to be in friendly relations. It's not easy to, to live with 15 neighbors, but we have been trying our best. One of the issues in the conflict in Syria is the presence of Hezbollah, which has been uh, historically supported by the Iranian government. Uh, how would you respond to the allegation that Hezbollah's activity in Syria actively undermines the stability and security of those people, both Arab and Jewish, living in Israel? You see, Hezbollah is, uh, in fact, uh, a political party, a legitimate political party in Lebanon. And you can see that they have been uh, elected by the people. They have, uh, in fact, been uh, participating in the general election, and the people have voted for, for Hezbollah. So you can uh, go to the politics of Lebanon and see why they have been elected to be in the parliament, but that's a reality. So it means that the people have confidence in the representatives of Hezbollah to be, to be re representing them in the parliament. So Hezbollah is a very important political party in the political life of Lebanon. That's a reality. Uh, about their engagement in, in Syria, because you know that always uh, there, has, there have been some common concerns and elements between Syria and Lebanon. You know that Lebanon, for some time, uh, in so many years ago, was occupied by Syria for some time. So there have been common enemies and common uh, dif difficult elements uh, uh, going through Syria from Lebanon or vice versa. So in certain period of time, Hezbollah was uh, trying to help the Syrian government to in fact, not allow the 
the Daesh forces or some of the allied forces of Daesh to enter into Lebanese territory because they were very afraid that if those uh, military elements of Daesh and ISIS would enter into Lebanese territory, it would be difficult for them to fight these elements because Lebanon has, a, uh, in fact, a modest army. <coughs> they do not have a sophisticated, uh, I mean, army with uh, sophisticated uh, armaments. So they were trying their best to uh, kill this possibility of entering their Daesh territories in the Syrian territory and not allow them to be in the Lebanese territory and fight them in the territory of Lebanon. I understand. I'd like to move on to questions from the audience now. So if you please do have a question. Raise your hand up and wait for the microphone to come to you. Let's start with the hand near the back. Salam. Um, I kind of want to ask a historical question and your perspective on it. So when the Iranian revolution did happen, the uh, US embassy was occupied. Do you think this was a historical mistake for Iran? Because they could have said, well, the Soviet Union, which is a communist country, is the shaitan and we should occupy the so USSR embassy instead of the US. Because there's a lot of countries who hate what America stands for, such as Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, but they're still allies with them. They still have economic relations with them. Do you think this is this was indeed a big mistake. Because even I remember Prime Minister Ahmadinejad was one of the people who said amongst the student union in Tehran University, we should occupy the USSR MC instead of the US MC. So do you think that was a mistake for Iran? And if you did go with that option, that Iran, though hating the United States, would have attacked the loser of the Cold War and still would have been rich today. Thank you. Should I respond now? Our relations with the United States has been a very difficult relationship. As you know, uh, it's very vivid in the minds of the Iranians that, uh, in fact, the United States uh, orchestrated a coup d'etat against the national government of Iran in 1953. And that was not easy for the Iranians to digest. And uh, one element of Iranian revolution certainly was to rich independence and uh, that was among the very important slogans of the Islamic revolution. So when we had the revolution, unfortunately the United States was not satisfied and happy <coughs> about what happened because the, the Shah was uh, serving as a semi or a puppet at the time and the relationship between Iran and the United States was very extensive. There were 40,000 of US troops stationed in Iran at the time. All facets of the Iranian politics and life was, in fact, overshadowed uh, the other, uh, in, in different respects by the US policy. So the vision of Iranians was not very helpful, uh, the, in fact, to when we are talking about the US, in fact, uh, politics. After the revolution, the United States did not try to correct its actions, but try really to continue such uh, behavior as an adversary to the Islamic revolution. Here, there were some uh, concerns by students, and they were raiding the, uh, in fact, the uh, the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. The government of Iran at the time did not support this act, <coughs> but that was a kind of political act by the Students' Union. Maybe it's not good to speak of the Student Union on um, this issue here, but that was a reality. Uh, they coordinated, state, I mean, Students' Union coordinated and acted against the U.S. Embassy. Historians are telling us that maybe it's not scientific to say that an event was a mistake or not a mistake. That was a reality. I cannot and do not want to judge about the, uh, was it a mistake or not a mistake. That was a reality. That was the manifestation of the <coughs> anger 
between Iranian people for the U.S. policies, and they angered, and they rushed to the U.S. Embassy, and they found documents which could show that the United States Embassy was extensively interfering in the internal affairs of Iran. And those documents were published in Iran, the original documents. So that was a part of history, and that was the manifestation of Iranian anger. But, uh, of course, it has consequences. We cannot uh, <coughs> deny that there were consequences. But the reality is that, in fact, that was part of our historical relationship with the United States. And that was, as I said, one part of the anger uh, demonstrated to the US, which was particularly uh, policies which started well before and after the coup d'etat against the Iranian national government at the time. Great, thank you. Moving on to the next question. Yes, let's go to the hand over here, the gray jumper. Uh, thank you, Akha, for speaking here at the home of free speech. Um, but I'd like to ask you about the persecution of journalists in Iran, which has been happening for at least a decade now, but came to a head last year with the freezing of assets of 152 BBC journalists and um, a national security investigation into them and their families. Um, there was an appeal to the UN last year, and there have been instances of harassment of their families inside Iran, threats of violence both to them and to the journalists outside Iran, which is worrying given your government's history of violence, targeted violence outside its borders. You need only look at Bakhtiar. Um, do you feel that it's, that it's deserved that journalists of an organization that is internationally respected for its impartiality and the quality of its coverage should face this kind of harassment? And even if you refute that impartiality, do you think that journalists should be persecuted only because they're critical of your government? I assure you that we do not prosecute any uh, professional journalist uh, or working with the news agency because he's doing a professional job. On the matter that BBC is impartial or not, I, I, don't, uh, I don't have any comment on this. We can discuss it uh, uh, at a different subject, as a different subject, but the reality is that in fact we have uh, explained uh, because they are raising this issue at the international fora, and we have explained at those international fora that this is a total misunderstanding about a uh, decision made in Iran. There is no persecution for the uh, BBC journalists, particularly their families. That's total, uh, in fact, nonsense that we would use uh, pressure against the families to pressurize the BBCs. We have, uh, we, have, we have told the BBC that if you have any report, any particular report that the families have been harassed or have been under any kind of persecution, just report those, those issues to us. We would immediately take action on them, but we would deny that there would be any pressure against any family uh, of the a BBC journalist working in Iran. Uh, certainly we, we can understand it as a fundamental and basic issue that the families uh, are not responsible for what in fact the other peoples are doing if what they are doing would be considered as a kind of uh, a misbehavior or a crime, which is not so. So the reality is that in fact uh, there has been very rare things that they have uh, they have uh, reported to us and we have explained to them that in fact there have been just very rare cases that can, can happen uh, not only for the, for the families of journalists but for, for other, other people and these are not, I assure you, uh, any, anything serious and uh, we are committed to re in fact to preserve uh, the uh, in fact integrity of the, of the family and, in fact, the family of all journal journalists in Iran and also journalists themselves. Excuse me, uh, are you implying that things like um, Masi Ali Dinidajad, her sister was pressured to come on state television to denounce her? 
Masih. That is a fact. Masih Ali Ali Dina Najad. Ali Dina Najad. Yeah, Ali Najad. Okay. Uh, her family came on state television fairly recently in the last month yes. to disown her. Are you saying that that happened organically and without any pressure from the government and from security forces? Are you saying that kind of thing doesn't happen? I can point to several instances of BBC journalists having their families brought in for questioning about their activities, which, in the repressive climate of the Islamic Republic, is quite serious and terrifying. Let's, let's say the other side of the story. Are you telling that the families of journalists should be immune of any persecution, even if they would uh, do any wrongdoing in Iran, for example? Because they are families of the journalists working outside, they should be immune of any persecution, of any, uh, for example, legal proceedings in a country. Because the reality is that nobody is immune of the legal proceedings in a country, be it the families of the journalists, the families of diplomats, the families of the officials, because now it's a very heated discussion in Iran that even the families of the officials should not be immune of any kind of legal proceedings. So it's not the case that if for any particular reason any person would be facing with the legal proceedings because that's a kind of legal issue uh, 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 in fact started by another person. If for example one person has a complaint about another person and that person is incidentally a, a family of the for example journalists working outside how we can justify that you should not touch them they should not be subject to any legal proceeding because they are a family or their families of the journalists working outside I mean that's that's not a possibility I mean uh, in Iran so everybody should be subject to legal proceedings. They can go to the court and, and convince the court. And this is that, for example, this complaint is not valid. And that would be resolved. The, the question that we are, we are discussing here, that we would, for example, detain a, a family in Iran be, to say that you are detained, you are subject to legal proceedings because your, your family is, is working outside of Iran in a news agency, or uh, she's journalist, or he's journalist. That is impossible. We do not have any law abiding the security forces to go and detain or uh, start a legal proceedings against any, uh, any person because he's the, or she's the, relevant of a journalist working outside of Iran. Sorry, it's Thank one you. thing. Sorry, that's all we have time for. It's one follow-up per question. So we'll move on to the next question now. Yes, the uh, gentleman in the red jumper at the end of the row here. Hello, and thank you. Um, I'm reading from The Economist an article titled Russia struggles to balance between Israel and Iran. And in it, it details that um, Israel and the Israel and Russian interests are converging and that the Iranian and Russian interest interests are diverging. If this is truly the case, what is the future of Iran given its allies, its allies internationally and in the re and regionally and how can it survive and how what is the strategy in such a world? Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, that's the reality of international relations. You cannot find two states that in fact they have uh, converging on all issues or you can find cannot find two states who are uh, diverging on all issues it's impossible maybe in, with one state you have 80 percent convergence 20 percent divergence or vice versa so with uh, each and every country you can calculate that how much you have convergences you have divergences of course it's not uh, something hidden that recent years after G JCPOA we have more convergences with the with Russian government because uh, they have a policy also to maintain the credibility of the JCPOA Iran nuclear deal and we have th the same position so we are uh, converging more than before but it doesn't mean that we have no divergent issues on, on any issue so that's a natural phenomenon of international relations. We have certainly divergence, we have convergence, but we, uh, according to the convergences and divergences, we have consultations and we have negotiations with different countries. 
to increase the convergences and decrease the divergences. On Israel, of course, it's an exceptional case because we do not have any relationship. We uh, do not recognize, uh, in fact, the state of Israel. So that's the uh, exception for us. But with other nations, we are always trying to see which are the convergences and which are the divergences. Thank you. We'll take one final question. Um, let's go to the uh, woman here. So, um, one of the issues now is uh, the missile program of Iran. Is there any prospect of changing in policies uh, of Iran's missile program in the region? Uh, or in the other words, um, does negotiations, all these negotiations have any effect on the policies of Iran in the region when it comes to the missile program and the weapons? I have very vivid memories, maybe uh, you can ask Iranians at my age, that they, we remember very uh, clearly that when, during the time that we had war with Iraq and we were uh, living in different cities in Iran, uh, all, maybe many of the Iranian cities were under the threat of missiles coming from the Iraq. And that was the origin of Iran thinking seriously about, uh, in fact, increasing the capacity to be developing missiles uh, to, to be able to secure its people and secure its country. So we started this program and, in fact, we have a, we have a national program which is genuinely developed in our country. It's not dependent on any other country. And we have designed this uh, to be working as a defense, not an offense. We, we have a doctrine, uh, which is a, a defense doctrine. We want to use missiles to only secure our, our people and our country. The second element that we have uh, agreed to be as a, a fundamental characteristic of our missile program is that it should not be associated in any manner with the weapons of mass destruction. Iran is among the rare examples in the region which is party to the non-proliferation treaty, to chemical weapons convention, to the biological weapons convention. We are parties to all treaties banning weapons of mass destruction. So we have uh, the assurances that we would not be developing any kind of missile which could be characterized as be associated with weapons of mass destruction. This would be our fundamental policy. So with these two uh, uh, characteristics in mind, we do not think that our missile program would be in, in any manner, any threat to any, any other country. So we have developed this missile only to develop, in fact, uh, uh, security for our own country. Thank you. So there's not going to be any changes. I'm sorry, that's all, that's all we have time for. Unfortunately, the ambassador's on a tight schedule. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming today. Your Excellency, thank you very much for your informed perspective. <laughs>